history and now history and you know, uh, like I can actually label a map of the United States. Oh, that's just that I can do. I can I can label every state correctly. But what map. I'm ready when you guys are. Okay. Who would like to ask the first question? Oh, sure. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, I just want to start off by letting you introduce yourself and, you know, give your, you know, your full bio or short bio this morning. Well, I, my, my name is Greg Baldwin, and I've done, I've done quite a lot of work, and I've been lucky to work on some really cool franchises, but mainly what I'm known as is the successor of the voice match for Mako Arumatsu. And uh, that has truly been one of the, the greatest challenges and also one of the greatest blessings of my life because it's one thing to walk in and take over as the voice of an iconic character but i was going in and i was also taking over as the voice of the iconic actor that voiced the iconic character so that that's always been the challenge to me and even now i don't really like watch hearing my own performance in avatar or samurai jack because when you set it against Mako's performance, it's just, you know, I, I still hear the difference. To this day, I listen to myself and I go, how did you ever get hired, Paul? You know, you're going to get fired any time. It's like, no, wait, they can't fire me. The shows have wrapped. But, you know, <laughs> it, it, it goes through my mind. So, did you ever have, like, a prior relationship with Mako? Like, did he ever guide you and say, hey? No, I never, I never had the opportunity to meet him. And that's, frighteningly, the Internet is sometimes wrong. I hope, because it says that I actually was his understudy, which I never met him. I did have the great pleasure. It was the second to last record of Samurai Jack. And uh, I, had wa I walked in to Cartoon Network and signed in, and I noticed that someone ahead of me had signed Mako. I thought, well, that's, that's kind of sick. But, you know, no matter. I went back to the green room, and I'm sitting there, and, and Gendy Tartakovsky, the creator of the show, says, Greg, come over here. There's somebody I want you to meet. This is Mako's daughter and grandson, also named Mako. They're going to be watching the recording session today. And I'm going, well, first of all, Kendi, I really wish you might have given me a heads up there, because it's one thing to do the voice of this iconic actor. It's another thing to imitate the voice of someone's beloved father. And so I am literally just freaking out during the recording session. And I am, thank, thank goodness, I'm situated where I can't see them on the other side of the glass, but Phil Lamar, who, who voices Samurai Jack, was and he said the minute I started to speak, Mako's daughter leans back in her chair and just says this. And then after the uh, after the session was over, we, we leave. I leave the recording booth and she comes right up to me with tears in her eyes and says, "Thank you so much." It was like he was in the room with me again. And I always think of all the things that I've done or will ever do, professionally or, or whatever, that I think is the most impactful and I'm proudest to be able to do that and to give them a gift back in exchange for all the gifts that I've received. And I, and I also, because you, you, you think about yourself, and I just think, you know, man, what, what I wouldn't give to even hear a bad imitation of my father's voice again. And so that, that is as close as I actually ever got to Mako personally. You know, I, someday I intend to meet him, but not today. <laughs> not, not, not for a while, you know. We'll eventually we'll get together, but yeah, give me give me a little time. Yeah. That. <laughs> so I don't want to hog any questions. Okay, so um, which how would you describe like the process of learning like the voices to make sure that you're on par with the um, acting for you? Well, again, again, it depends on the voice. I mean, Mako and Aku and, and uh, Iro are very very specific because I'm doing right. a voice match. Uh, my approach. Sometimes, and this is actually a, a, something taught to me by my good friend uh, Jack Bennett, who voices Johnny Bravo, and I went to college with him. I know him very well. It's sometimes a good idea to start off with an impression of a character, of, of, of a known actor, because it's a good place to start out with. Eventually, it becomes your own. And, and for example, I voiced a character in the Clone Wars called uh, Terra Sinube, who was a Jedi. He's a very, very, very old Jedi whose lightsaber is in his cane. And this is the voice I used. But if you go back and you watch the first two Harry Potter movies and listen to Richard Harris as Dumbledore, you'll realize that's actually what I'm doing with the character. And that's, it's, it's a, I, I find, uh, and sometimes I think it's cheating, but I tend to think of it more as a shortcut. It, may, it makes it a lot easier. The character will become your own, but if you have a voice in your head that you can start out with, 
then, then you're ahead of the game, I think. Um, if you don't want me asking, you've been in the game, you've been pretty much been in the game for almost 14 years. Um, and you've had the opportunity to witness how voice acting has evolved and changed and everything else. Are there any particularly notable changes from, um, as a professional that you've noticed in the field? Oh, huge. When I, when I first started doing it, I had to literally drive from my house in Burbank over the hill and go to my agency. I think it was on Fairfax at the time. So you would have to literally physically go there, go into their recording booth to audition. And that, but more and more, that became, oh, well, you simply audition from your home computer. But now, it's you don't even have, to, not only do you audition from your home computer, but most, most voice actors now have literal home studios as a result of COVID. So yeah, that, that, and it's a good thing, and it's, it's great because I don't have to get on, on the road, I don't have to go anywhere, the commute is fantastic. But there is something to be said, for me at least, of being in the room with a, with a voice director who can like sort of, I'm not that imaginative, you know? I'm one of those actors, oh, all actors want to direct. No, I don't want to direct too much responsibility. I want a director to tell me what they want. Mm -hmm. And I miss that, you know? Because, and, and also, when you're recording at home, there's a technical aspect of it. But I've learned to do it, but I'm always terrified that, uh, I'm, I'm on a show now for Disney called uh, The Ghost of Molly McGee, and I record it from, from my home studio, and I'm always terrified that I hit the wrong button. You know, because I'm not a sound engineer, you know, a sound engineer, and they're going, oh man, we just, we have to do the whole session over again, call everybody back. So that's that's another aspect that voice actors now are sort of sound engineers as well. We didn't have to use, you know, didn't used to be. But again, the commute, you can't beat it. You know, the commute is fantastic. Do you have any advice for aspiring voice actors, people who are looking to either change careers or enter, the, enter into the craft for the first time? You know, it's... Uh, it's not, a, you know, it's a wonderful field. It's not the easiest field. I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to sugarcoat it. It's not, it's, it's hard to get into. But don't ever let anyone tell you you can't get into it. You know, I was 46 years old when I was cast as Iro. I was looking at 50. So if it's something you really want to do, don't, first of all, persevere and don't ever let anyone tell you you can't do it. In terms of technique, it's good to learn as many accents as you can. It's good to learn how to do impressions. Uh, and I think it was Andre Romano, who's the voice director for Avatar, who once said voice acting. People say, oh, I want to I be a voice actor. The operative word is not voice. The operative word is actor. You have to be an actor. Voice acting is acting more than anything else. And in some ways, I think it's more true acting because you are not if I go to, you know, I don't do a lot of on-camera, but I have. And if you go to an on-camera audition, usually they're auditioning for several different things at the same time in the casting office. And all I have to do is look for all the fat old white guys. And I know that that is where I belong. That's where I'm going. Uh, but with voice acting, I don't have to be just a fat old white guy. I can be anything. I can be the literal incarnation of evil as an Aku, or I can be an old Jedi master, or I, you know what? That to me has always been the fun of it. Is my physicality has nothing to do with it. It has nothing to do with it for anyone in voice acting. And in a way, it's kind of liberating, I think, you know? So on the, uh, on the conversation of like how pandemic has changed like voice acting, like, so when you get, like say, like the size, right? Like, does the voice director give you notes or do they give you notes afterwards? Because I, mean, I know you mentioned that the ADR director is not there. Yep. No, you, usually I will simply, they will send me the audition, you know, the sides with the brief description from, you know, the, the, the client. And that's it. I record it. I send it back. I can do as many takes as I like until I'm happy with it. But no, most of the time, and that's what I'm missing, that the, there's no voice, it's all on me with the audition. And it used to be there was another voice in that that could guide you. Now you simply record the audition, send it off, and hope for the best. And then the hard, the hard, this is the hardest thing about voice acting and acting in general, is they never call you when you didn't get it. And so, you know, you learn that, you know, okay, it's been five days, okay, they have a call, I didn't get that gig. And that, it would be nice if they did, so, you know, think, thank you, well, I'm sorry, you were very good, but we're going to pass. They don't do that. You just, they go silent. And I think, I think with Avatar, and I had gone through like four auditions, and then it was another three weeks before they called me to tell me I got the gig. And at, again, I had given up on that as well. So now it's been three weeks, I didn't get it, it's done, you know, move on, although I really, really wanted it badly. Uh, 
And yeah, that's that's. I, I miss the voice. I miss the booth director very much. That of all of all the pre-pandemic things that I miss, but there were many. But uh, that that would definitely be one of them. Mr. Keith, do you have a question, sir? Yes. Um, what is your big three for anime? Like, what's your favorite anime? I'm, I I will be honest with you. I don't watch a lot of anime. I'm, I, I you know, and I I've actually asked my kids. I said, because you know what? Give me some things that I should watch. I mean, I. This is a weird answer, but you know what? I think I think you could absolutely say this is anime. I grew up watching a show called Speed Racer. Yes. If you ever watched Speed Racer, I, I think I that was a very for and I, I remember I love the voice acting in that show. And I can do a pretty remember Pops Racer? Remember? Mm -hmm. I do a pretty good impression of Pops Racer who always talked like this. Mm, okay, Speed. <laughs> mm. uh, so yeah, and I guess that it actually it was made in Japan. That actually makes yeah. it officially anime. Uh, some things, my, my kids, I said, what should I watch? What was it? One Punch Man is something my son suggested, something that he thinks that I would enjoy. And I, always, I really should get into it more, because for the fan base, I should at least have a good working knowledge of it. But I'm an old guy, you know? I, you know? A lot of them have like hundreds of episodes you got to try to catch up on. Yeah. Do we have time for one more question? Do you want to be my last, do you want to finish yours? Quick you, you got one more, sweetheart? Yeah. Um, what was one of your favorite lines from your voice work you done? The favorite line? Yeah. The line that I, I can't really say without talking a little bit about Iroh himself and what a unique character he is because not only is he beautifully written, but I, I have seen by meeting these fans the impact that he has had in people's lives. He really makes people, I, I, I say Iroh makes everyone a better version of themselves all the way from Zuko to Greg Baldwin. And I remember this because my wife and I had literally moved to New Mexico where I was born. The kids were grown, you know, they were launched, and so we said, let's go move back and live in a, in a chiller place. So we moved to New Mexico. Two weeks later, the pandemic hit. So we're in a place where we didn't know anyone. We had left our friends in our home for 30 years in Burbank, and we're freaking out. This is in the days when there's no toilet paper. And I'm going, oh my God, you know, we left, we left. I've got a son in New York, New York, my God. My daughter's in Pasadena, my God, what have we done? And I remember walking. And, and with those thoughts, and I heard a bird sing, and clear as a bell in my in my head, I heard Iroh's line: "If you look for the light, you will often find it. If you look for the dark, that is all you will ever see." And from that point on, it that that line helped me through the whole experience. I just to remember, as, as and, and indeed today, as as bad and as bleak as things sometimes are, if you just look for the good things, you'll find that there's a lot more good things than bad things, and just don't dwell on them. And, and, and it's a conscious effort. You have to look. You have to actually look. It's a verb. You know, it's an action. And that, I think, of all of my lines, that comes back to me again and again and again.